I'm Tim Rogers, chair of the Danforth Center Friends Committee, and welcome to our first ever Danforth Center virtual conversations event. Tonight, we'll take part in a conversation about a topic that is very of the moment, education. With back to school imminent for most and even begun for some, and with the pandemic forcing schools to pivot to a variety of platforms, education, research, outreach, and equity are on all of our minds. In fact, tonight's event is evidence of our ability to pivot too. Since 2003, the conversation series has offered the public the opportunity to learn about and benefit from the work of the Danforth Center and its partners. These conversations feature leading experts in plant science, education, conservation, and related disciplines. They're speaking on topics of regional and global urgency, and what could be more urgent than the future of our kids. The need to feed and power a growing, changing world while also preserving the environment is one of the great challenges of the 21st century. To meet that challenge, we're going to need more scientists, more leaders, and a scientifically literate citizenry. The Danforth Center's Education Research and Outreach Department has a plan and the proven partnerships to help. We're delighted to welcome one of those partners tonight, Dr. Corey S. Bradford Sr., President of Harris Stowe State University. Dr. Bradford has 27 years of experience in higher education, but he began his tenure at Harris Stowe this spring. I imagine he can share many trial by fire moments already, as well as his vision for the future, both near term during the pandemic and longer term for our region. From the Danforth Center, we're joined by Dr. Christine callis Stool, the Sally and Derek Dreemeyer Director of Education Research and Outreach. Chris has a particular dedication to education effectiveness and was able to respond quickly to assess virtual instruction in college programs this spring. I know I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Our moderator tonight will be St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Fenske, producer and host of St. Louis on the Air. Sarah has worked for 20 years as a reporter and editor, and with two small children of her own, education is a subject she is concerned and passionate about. I know this will be an interesting and timely conversation among these accomplished professionals, but before we begin, a few thank yous for helping to make this evening possible. Thanks to my colleagues on the Friends Committee and the Conversations Committee for their continued support and commitment to this program and for helping us transition to a virtual format. Thank you to the media sponsors of the Conversation Series, St. Louis Public Radio and HEC Media. And beginning on Sunday, August 30th, you can view the HEC recording of tonight's event on Sundays at 5 p.m. and Saturdays at 7 a.m. through September. It's thanks only to a supportive community that the Danforth Center can host these programs and carry out its important work. I'd like to extend a special welcome to those joining us this evening for the first time. If you're intrigued to learn more, and I think you will be, please visit the Danforth Center website, danforthcenter.org. I encourage you to join me and countless others in advancing the Danforth Center mission with your contribution of financial support as well. Now, if you have a question during tonight's conversation, simply use the questions tool at the right side of your screen to send it to us at any time. Questions will be addressed as time permits. Check out the post in a few days time on the Danforth Center website. Finally, we depend on your feedback to make these programs as meaningful and motivational as possible, especially for this, our first ever virtual conversation. You'll receive a brief email survey from us shortly. It takes only 60 seconds or so to fill out. It will be a great opportunity to share your thoughts about this program and to let us know what's working well and how we might improve. Thanks in advance for your feedback. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Corey Bradford, Dr. Chris callis and Sarah Fenske to begin tonight's conversation. 
Thank you, Tim, and thank you to the Danforth Center Friends Committee. It's exciting to be here. I think this is such an important conversation, and because of how important it is, I do want to just dive right in. So many of us were positively lost this spring when everything shut down and we all moved to digital, but Dr. Callistool, I understand you just jumped in there and pretty quickly moved to survey college students about the things that were going on around them in the shutdown. Your survey looked at more than 1,000 college students at 29 universities. What did you learn, just to start things off, about their anxiety levels from talking to them at that time? Yeah, so we, one of the great things about being at the Danforth Center is that we are able to do things really nimbly and get involved very quickly. So um, we got some pre-survey data from students before they transitioned from that face-to-face -face class to the online class. And during that survey, they expressed really high levels of anxiety. I think that's what we were all feeling at the time. Um, and what they told us was that their anxiety really stemmed from the unknown. They didn't know how their classes were going to move online, what the expectations were going to be. They talked about things about their exams. Are the exams going to be in the same format? Are the grades going to be the same kind of format? Are the expectations changing? And then we surveyed them again at the end of the semester, and we saw their anxiety levels plummet. Hmm. They were actually, they talked about being less anxious than they had been um, before the start of the semester, because at the end, they were able to talk about how you know, the transition, while maybe not entirely smoothly, was fine. That, um, that they were, once they were able to understand what the expectations were, they found ways to meet those expectations. Um, they did talk about, you know, they wished that they had a lot more communication ahead of time so that their anxiety level was less going into it. And they felt that if, if they had known, they could have made preparations for how to transition to online learning more effectively. But I think, you know, we were all going through those growing pains of how do we move from a face-to-face -face situation to an online situation. So that anxiety ended up dropping, but I'm also interested in hearing how did their attitude toward class evolve as they moved entirely to online? Yeah, uh, so I think their attitude overall was, very, was lower. They talk about how they really do prefer face-to-face -face classes and in-person learning. The same as most of us do when we're in social situations. We would much prefer to have dinner with our extended family than have a, a FaceTime dinner session, right? And they talk about things like that also. Um, so they were less happy overall with the online class and the face-to-face -face class. We also surveyed faculty, the faculty who were teaching these students, as well as uh, over 100 faculty across the country at various different types of universities. Universities. And we're starting to see a pattern that if the faculty were trained on how to do online learning, and that's not just the technology. The technology is the first level of that. How do you use Zoom effectively? How do you use uh, the Google Classroom or whatever platform you're using effectively? Um, but really the pedagogy behind how do you effectively teach students in a virtual setting. The, the instructors who had that ahead of time, that knowledge, their students were much happier in those, in those online classes than they were in the face-to-face -face classes. They felt that, that, that they got a lot more out of that class, where the faculty who had not had that training prior to the transition, and I will say that 40% of the faculty, over 40% of the faculty that we surveyed have still never had any kind of training in online ed ed teaching. Um, and so those, those students reported um, uh, you know, that they didn't get as much out of the class, so their attitudes were lower. Dr. Bradford, that seems like a real challenge then for administrators, when so much of how students are responding ties into how their teachers are, are trained and if they feel ready for this. Mm -hmm. What then can administrators do dealing with a, a situation like that? Do you think we were ready when we had to do this all last spring? Well, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say we were ready but I think we quickly adapted, and that was key to universities being able to pull this off in such a short time. You know, our faculty, they take pride in their work, and they want to deliver the highest quality of education to our students. And so our faculty quickly adjusted, you know, to this online learning platform, and many of them had to go through quick training, 
you know, it wasn't the necessary long-term training that you need to be proficient in this, but they did what they could to get it up and running so students can continue their education. You know, we have a lot of students, you know, depending on this education because a lot of them were planning for graduation, they're looking forward to their career opportunities, and so they wanted to continue their education. And so I think in times like this, it's important that we work together as a unit. And so as an administrator, you want to do whatever you can to support our faculty and our students. And so we had to provide the technology upgrades that were needed in order to provide this service to all of our students. We had some technology challenges with some students who didn't have access to Wi-Fi, and so we had to provide hotspots for some students and loaner computers. You know, we just had to make it work. That was, my, that was our driving force, was how can we make this work for us to? Dr. Hannah still do you see any commonalities between the colleges that were more prepared for a moment like this versus the ones who were caught a little more off guard? Well, honestly, I think every university was caught off guard, as was the world. Well, nobody was prepared to go move from a face-to-face -face classroom to an online classroom, and everyone was doing the best that they could. But I'm looking forward to seeing how this transitions into the fall now, because we've had several months of preparation. Um, you know, it's, an, it's a moving target in many ways, and we're starting to see schools that have opted to go face-to-face. -face. Some of, many of those are, are in the news because they're starting to move then into this online and virtual learning instead. Um, but with this uh, ability to, to prep ahead of time, there are really good ways of teaching online. Uh, and there's a lot of research that's been done over the last 10 years in how to do that. And so schools uh, like Harris Stowe, who have partnered with other universities who have experience with that, um, they're better prepared for the online teaching aspect. Dr. Bradford, how has having those, those months to get ready for this fall semester, how has things changed? Uh, how has that changed things at Harris Stowe? Well, you know, I think it has really helped our faculty, you know. Uh, one of the things we try to do is see who's doing well in this space. And so we've reached out to Arizona State University and they reached out to about four other HBCUs to come up with a, 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 a training program to develop online courses with us. So by partnering with others who are really good in this space, I think that gives our faculty confidence and that we can provide a high quality online experience for our students. But you know, all of that takes time, but we started that process and we constantly bring in experts to help our faculty to deliver a better online presence for our students. And what led you to choose Arizona State? What, what did they have going on that you liked? Well, I mean, I think they're one of the larger players in this space, mm -hmm. you know, and so they have been doing this for a number of years, and so, Matter of fact, it might be the leading public university in online education. And so why not partner with them? You know, a smart guy tell me, go with the guy that's doing the best, right? <laughs> Dr. Calistool, I see you nodding. They're known for just having this down. Yeah, so Arizona State about four or five years ago started a fully online biology major. And, um, and there's been some growing pains, but the data coming out of that program is really promising for being able to access education from anywhere, quality, high-level education, and get a bachelor's in biology from the comfort of your own computer. And so, you know, they've had a lot of lessons learned, and I think them being able to guide other universities and how to do that effectively is amazing. That seems like a trickier major, too, to do online. When I think of biology, I think of dissecting frogs, and they're able to pull that off in the online space. Are they still able to give students that hands-on experience um, in a program like that? They are. Um, so there are various different ways to do, say, laboratories uh, when you don't have access to an in-person lab. In fact, this summer, what our program has been doing is working at transitioning our classroom lab experiences where students participate in the research being done here at the Danforth Center by running those experiments in their classroom and helping our scientists collect data. 
we've been figuring out ways to transition that to the home environment, the home-based environment, so that students around the country, and particularly here in St. Louis, can start running the experiments that they would be doing in a classroom, but running those at home. And some of them are completely virtual. So we, for example, have students who are able to help us with a data analysis of plant images, as our uh, center collects thousands of plant images. Uh, this, we can't get through all of them really effectively, and so students we, with a little training are able to help us do that and come up with amazing discoveries out of that data set. And so Arizona State has been doing similar things, finding ways for students to be able to do research in their backyards using citizen science projects and doing uh, virtual research by looking at things like data science or analyzing large data sets. There are also many good simulations that are available online. And so when you use a, a mixed methods approach of doing some hands-on things and some simulations and some uh, virtual data analysis, you really do get a fairly rich experience that is the equivalent to a lab setting. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bradford, uh, talk to us about how that works at Harris Stowe this fall. I know you're doing a hybrid plan, but it's a hybrid plan that leads very strongly towards the virtual. Yes. Yeah, at Harris Stowe, uh, the majority of our courses are going to be delivered online. Matter of fact, all of them can be delivered in an online capacity. A student has the choice just never to go to class. A student has the choice to, to choose which one. Uh, so we're going to start off the semester with all classes online for the first four weeks. Mm -hmm. And then we have a set of classes that are hybrid, that are more laboratory based, hands-on based type of courses for students to take. Uh, it was important for us to give the students some flexibility and options there uh, because some students really need that in-person in learning, right? Uh, if they wanted a fully online education, they would have just went to one of those providers. But we're a traditional university, and we pride ourselves on touching our students, you know, you know allowing them to in interact with one another, engage in the learning environment, in the learning process. And so, yes, it's, it's a little bit different this fall. So it's, it's not the same as normal, but we're trying to do our best to make the students comfortable with the current state of things. Dr. Cowles, a bigger picture, what does the research tell us about how an online classroom will end up impacting students' learning styles? Um, well, so learning style is a bit of a misnomer. Students are going to learn in whatever format they're given because they will find ways to learn if provided the right tools. Hmm. So it's really up to the instructor to provide a variety of tools and support for the students. So some of the things we find are the most important for seeing student success, uh, including uh, the duration of, of participation in a class, is the sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. If a student feels like they belong within that classroom, they're going to persist even in, in, when things get difficult. And so creating, for example, a sense of belonging online could be as easy as uh, getting students into small groups to talk about topics, uh, providing students the opportunity to express things about themselves. So in our faculty survey, as well as our student survey, we saw uh, people talk about uh, discussion boards that had nothing to do with the topic at hand, but really about social issues. So one instructor said that they provided an instruction, uh, a discussion board for um, first responders during COVID. And that, dis that discussion became quite a rich discussion that had nothing to do with class, but provided those students an opportunity to create a community and a sense of belonging in an online environment. And so we, what we saw in our survey with the students, it, we, when we went into surveying the students, we really thought that their sense of belonging would go down when they went into the online uh, learning. But for instructors who, made an effort to create these communities, we saw their sense of belonging go up. And so once they feel that they have a place, they will find ways of learning. They'll start creating these small groups. They'll create opportunities to discuss with their, uh, with their uh, classmates. And that's really when they're gonna have the most learning. So like I said, it's not, it's not um, the same as teaching face-to-face. -face. The pedagogy is different in how you approach it. 
but the learning still happens. And, and often students will report that the independence they find and the freedom they find in being able to be self-driven in the online classes, they feel that that's a benefit. Hmm. Dr. Bradford, does that resonate with you, thinking of your students? It does. You know, a lot of times a student might speak up more online than they would in person. And so this allows them to maybe to participate in the chat, you know, the breakout room sessions. Uh, you know, our faculty are utilizing those poll tools to keep the students engaged. You know, I think that's the key. You got to get them engaged. I think today's students are comfortable with technology. You know, I have, a, you know, a couple of college graduates, recent college graduates, and they just live and die by their technology. You know, they know how to interact with one another through these different media. And so I think it's important for us to support that. I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. I think it's going to be a continuing part of our education delivery method going forward. You know, I, I don't see us just going completely just back to in-person learning without some form of online education. So now that you've had these months to gear up and, and to be ready for this long haul that, that you're predicting, which sadly I think you're probably right about, um, our issues of access to the internet and access to equipment, does that remain a challenge for a place like Harris Stowe? It does. It is a challenge, but we've tried our best to address that challenge, like I said. We try to provide our students with hot spots, and, 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 but nothing beats a quality internet service at home, right? Uh, and so a lot of students, uh, if they're low income, they can struggle by other means. You know, it's difficult to have Wi-Fi when you don't have power. Right. <laughs> and you mentioned this is yeah. one reason why you have some of your dorms open, very limited dorms open, but yeah. you wanted to provide that space for those who really need it. Yeah, we wanted to provide a safe space for those students who may be going through a difficult time. You know, we have to take into account all of our students. Yes, if you have a great home life, we encourage you to stay at home and take all of your classes online. But some students are actually homeless and they need some place to go where they can continue their academic. They, they, they had planned on being on campus for that year. And so we needed to make sure that we made some accommodation for those students who truly needed the support of the university so that they can continue their education. We did not want our students to stop out, take a gap year. We wanted them to stay engaged so that they can finish their degree on time. It was critically important that we provide that kind of service for our students. And tell me why a lot of people are encouraging the idea of, oh, you might as well just take a gap year now. Why didn't you want that for your students at Harris Stowe? Well, I mean, I think it's important for students to finish their degree, okay? A timely degree is, is, is important, right? And so I want to encourage students to, to, stay, um, to stay the course. Mm -hmm. Right, because when you take a gap year, things happen, you pick up a job, life happens. And so I don't want them getting away from their studies, you know, because I don't want them to fall behind. I want them to continue with their classmates and finish on time. That's critically important to them getting out in the workforce or going on to graduate school in a timely manner. Dr. Callis, is that a concern that, that students who think they're p putting pause on their education just sometimes don't come back? Yeah, absolutely. And what we're seeing from the national surveys of students is that minority students are disproportionately choosing not to go back to higher education this fall. Um, and that's uh, Latinx students as well as black African American students. The, it's over 30 percent have reported in national polls choosing not to go back to higher ed. And we are concerned that we're losing them out of the higher ed system entirely. That one gap year turns into two. And while gap years do can offer an enriching experience for students, for students who, are, who need to be able to earn an income and uh, get out into that workforce quickly, uh, Dr. Bradford is right, it, you know, getting through your education in a timely manner is essential. 
Now, we've been talking a lot about higher education today, and it's such an important topic, but I don't want to ignore elementary and secondary school students. Um, Dr. Bradford at, at Harris State, they obviously have the ability to welcome some students to live on campus. That's not an option for an elementary school student. How big a problem is some of this for those students, uh, Dr. callis Duell, if they don't have access to internet or they don't have a parent who's maybe able to help them with virtual learning? This has been a huge problem here in the St. Louis metro area, particularly in the spring when all of the schools shut down. There were many school systems, uh, Normandy as St. Louis public schools, reached out to companies in the area to look for excess technology that uh, had either been not in use, had been, dis uh, had been discontinued being in use, to get enough technology that the student, to get them out to their students. Uh, many of the school systems were successful in doing that. Uh, St. Louis Public Schools says that they have about a one-to-one -one student to, to, to device ratio for this coming fall now. Uh, not every school system was able to do that. And having a device does not necessarily mean access. So they might have a laptop, but they might not have consistent internet. They might not have consistent power um, and that, you know, so there are other barriers than just the device. And though, what we can do is be sympathetic to that. It's something we're continuing to, look, to try to get better at providing with internet hotspots um, that uh, the schools are providing as well as internet providers in the area. But as instructors, you also have to be aware that this happens and be sympathetic and be flexible about it. Find ways to help your students get access to the classes and to the learning. And that might be doing things asynchronously, meaning that maybe they didn't join in on that day Zoom session, but instead can watch that as a video later. Maybe they couldn't fill out a worksheet on Google Classroom, but instead were able to print it out and write it, but weren't able to type it into the Google Doc. Um, and we saw that happening a lot in the spring with students who might be able to fill out a paper sheet, take a picture of it, and email it to their teachers. But teachers are really at the, at the forefront of figuring out workarounds so that every student can access education. There's a lot of conversation about adjusting expectations. And Dr. Bradford, I'm curious about your thoughts of how do we manage adjusting expectations without lowering standards in ways that could make things worse for kids in the long run? Yeah, I don't believe in lowering standards. I believe in um, making adjustments, being flexible, so that you continue to provide the quality education that our students deserve. You know, uh, a lot of our students are dependent upon a quality education to lead to a better life. Okay, we don't want students to get behind or fall behind in their schooling. Because that just only complicates the problem right we want to keep our students on track and so a lot of the k-12 through schools have a, a big challenge because not everyone has a parent at home to work with the kids mm -hmm. so even when they have class you know you can't keep a kid online for six hours straight so there's a lot of in and out in coming back online and offline right and so you got to have a parent, if you're a young kid, to really be there to help you navigate that kind of interaction with technology. And so my biggest fear is that you have a lot of kids out there that's not getting the education they need. And so school districts have to work harder. They have to have greater outreach to get to those kids that's not responding because they don't know which ones are not responding when these class sessions are taking place. The question is, what are they doing about it? Dr. Calistil, do you think people have been doing enough to try to, to combat these problems? And these are, are problems that have been in existence in this area and across the United States that the that COVID-19 has made even more evident. The disparity in education has been in existence both at the K-12 level and higher ed. Um, but until there was a crisis 
it could be sort of band-aid over in many cases. And so it's gonna take a lot of hard work and a lot of looking at policies and reforms in really fundamental changes to our education system before a crisis is not going to cause the types of disparities that we're talking about. Um, and so it, it's not an easy fix. Uh, and it's something that, uh, our, that everybody in education is talking about, uh, but nobody yet has figured out how to change it. And does anything uh, strike either of you as, here's the next thing we need to do to, to move this conversation to the next step? Is there a solution here that it would be great to just get everybody on board for? Or are we not even at that point of having something identified? Yeah, I'm not sure we're at that point yet because we know that these differences exist. Mm -hmm. And the only way I think we're going to be able to address it is we, we work together as a community as a whole, you know, and, and try to close some of these uh, disparities. You know, African-American communities have been heavily hit health-wise yeah. by this virus as well. And so a lot of these students are seeing their relatives and family members who are, or who are sick and they're concerned. And so you have these, these, these pressure, stress levels that are higher in these African-American communities. And so a lot of help is needed, you know. And so we need to redouble our efforts in these areas where we know that, 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 that things are not going as well. Dr. Calisil, you mentioned earlier that school districts had reached out to corporations and that they did provide some much needed help when everything looked so chaotic in the spring. Do you think there's more um, that they can be doing if they wanted to be of help? So I think Dr. Bradford's right. The whole community needs to come together and that includes the companies in the area um, in order to help close the gaps in education. One of the simplest things to do for companies is to allow the flexibility of the people who work for you to understand that they are parents who are now turning into teachers and that they need support and flexibility to do that. Um, and, you know, so companies can put into place advice uh, people who have a background in education that can offer advice and answer questions when parents have them. Um, to train managers on how to be flexible and work around a parent's schedule when it comes to trying to, to juggle everything. Um, and then to continue to do outreach into the communities so that we are able to not only provide access to education but provide the basic needs because you know, I believe that education is the answer to the world's problems, but we can't get to the level of providing education until a student's basic needs are met. And as Dr. Bradford alluded to, many of the students in the area are food insecure, they're housing insecure, they don't have enough stability to even build on the importance of education. And so we do need to be working, particularly at this time when these disparities are at the forefront, when the health disparities are, are um, are higher in the African-American community, and that is compounding the educational disparities, we need to work at getting students those basic access so that they can then focus on education. Dr. Bradford, do you think people are talking to each other enough across various silos, taking down those silos, so to speak? Well, I hope so. I hope we are. You know, I'm hopeful that, you know, you know people are, are, are looking at, you know, in times of crisis, you know, nations rally together. And that's what I want to see in America. You know, this is a major crisis, and we need to be together, not divided, okay? When we are united, there's nothing this country cannot uh, accomplish or overcome. And that's what's needed, you know? And so that comes from leadership, too. And so we need our leaders to unite us on common purpose. And right now, let's focus on helping the elderly, the young, the sick, you know. And what about here in the state of Missouri? You talked about some of the things that, that you had to do on your campus mm -hmm. um, to make sure students had the access they needed and to put fewer students in the dorms. There's a financial cost with that, all, yeah. all sorts of things. Have you seen increased government support for the costs that you've had to take on? I have. You know, I will give the state of Missouri credit that they have provided us with uh, additional resources to reopen 
because you're right, our costs did go up because we had to have extra staff to, to help do health screenings and health checks. We had to have tech, you know, uh, technicians, you know, people who can help us with the IT support. Our cleaning crews, we had to increase our cleaning frequencies and deep cleaning. And so we had to have protective gear. Uh, testing, you know, testing is not cheap. It's very expensive. We had to test all of our students before they could move into the, to the residence hall. And we had to pay close to about $170 per test. So we didn't put it on the students. We pay for it as an institution. And you're able to make that pencil out at this point. At this point, but this early in the year, you know, ask me six months from now how we're doing. <laughs> okay. We will have to check back on that. Dr. Callistool, do you have that sense from our local public schools that serve younger children that they at this point are able to make this all pencil out? They're getting the support they need financially? Um, so what we're seeing is that they are pooling together. Um, you know, the, a lot of the schools have transitioned now over 80% of the, of the public school students in the greater metropolitan St. Louis area are doing virtual learning. Um, and so the expenses haven't really hit. Um, I think that will hit when we try to transition the students back to face-to-face -face learning. Mm -hmm. And, and those things that Dr. Bradford alluded to come into play. Um, but there, there have been additional expenses just in terms of getting student supplies, um, that everything that would normally be within a school is now being packaged up and sent home to individual students. Um, so there, there has needed to be a shift in that, and we've seen that happening. Um, so I, I don't know where the public schools are getting those funds from, but we do see them stepping up and, and providing that support for the students as needed. And if someone listening to this conversation feels called to want to help with these problems, are there ways an individual uh, can do anything that would, that would assist yeah. uh, our yeah. educators? Give money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could, we have a foundation and anyone can donate and help with emergency aid for students. And that support that goes directly yeah, to students. Yeah, that goes directly to students. You know, no matter what, what, what emergency needs they're having, this will help them. It's critically needed help, too. Dr. Callistool, what is the one thing that you wish people who are on the outside looking in at education, maybe shaking their fist at this decision or that, what is the one thing that you wish they understood about this moment we're in now? So I wish they would understand that we are all looking for the, at the best interest of our students. We all believe in education that our next generation is going to be the next leaders that are going to be our next problem solvers and innovators. And so we're trying to figure out how to do what's best for their education. But that also means that the, the teacher, we're asking a lot of teachers and we need to be patient as we make these transitions and supportive of the decisions that are being made because the decisions are not easy. They're not being taken lightly and they have, there are many moving parts that play into a decision to move either face-to-face -face or online or some in between. Um, and so while the public might not see what all the different chess pieces are on the board, know that the decision makers are taking them into consideration and really thinking about students first. And Dr. Bradford, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What is the one thing that you wish the general public would know about just the challenges in front of you in higher education and at Harris Stowe in particular? Yeah, I agree with Chris. These are not easy decisions, you know, and you really have to have empathy for others. You know, I, I truly believe that you have to put yourself in others' situation because, uh, you know, shutting down a campus and just going fully remotely doesn't meet everyone's needs, okay? And so that's what I had to take into consideration uh, uh, for our university based on the students that we serve. That you had good reasons for we making the choices you made. We had good reason because made. a lot of our students were in high-risk areas where they could easily contract this disease. They had family members who are essential workers who go out every day and could bring this back to them. And so maybe that's the takeaway for all of us is that we all just need a little more understanding. Yes. Well, I want to say thank you to our guest, Dr. Corey Bradford of Harris Stowe State University for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much.
And I also want to say thank you to Dr. Christine Callistool here of the Danforth Center. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us online tonight for the first ever Danforth Center Virtual Conversations. The next Virtual Conversations will take place online on Thursday, October 15th. It features local tech entrepreneur Jim McKelvey. Tonight's program, Inspiring Tomorrow's Scientists, was about education. The Danforth Center has a mission to improve the human condition through plant science. The goal includes access to high quality and effective science education for every student around the world a scientifically literate citizenry, a well-educated workforce, upward mobility and well-paying jobs, future entrepreneurs, innovators, leaders, scientists, a stronger St. Louis, a healthier planet, food security for all people. All of these are part of the mission of the Danforth Center. And if you are as impressed as I have been tonight, please check out their website. That's danforthcenter.org. And there you can learn more about everything the center is doing in St. Louis and around the world. And please remember to share your thoughts about tonight's program in the email survey. I'm Sarah Fenske of St. Louis Public Radio, and I want to thank you all for joining us, and good night.